Good morning. Well, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is a nice talk by Dr. Etoy. I'd like to follow this with some thoughts on open versus octoscopic stabilization, some general principles of when we might favor one versus another. Here are my disclosures, nothing that relates directly to this, this talk. I think in anything in surgery, medicine, start with considering basic principles. First, define the pathology. Dr. Vittori has gone through that very nicely already with bone issues and capsular issues and labral issues. Define the direction of instability. Are we treating unidirectional, anterior, or posterior, or in contrast, is this a multi-directional pattern? Patient factors are critical. Think about the sports demands of that athlete. Is this say, an athlete involved in overhead activities such as throwing or tennis, or is this a contact athlete, such as football or, or soccer or things like that? And then lastly, the tissue pathology. Again, is there a labral lesion? What is the status of the capsule? And is there bone loss? Important to, again, identify the pathology. Just some examples, your Bancart lesion on your left side there, Hill-Sachs lesion that you've just seen on the prior talk. We'll talk about humeral revulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. So uncommon, but on the uh, glenoid side, capsular disruption. This picture shows an uncommon posterior uh, Hegel lesion. Is there a rotator cuff tear? Again, unusual in your younger athletic patients, but your so-called posterior mechanism of instability may involve rotator cuff tear and or a tuberosity fracture. These are all things we need to think about identifying on our imaging studies. Is there a bone loss in the glenoid, of course? Is there an acute anterior glenoid fracture? Or more commonly, it's, it's gradual attritional bone loss that leads to the glenoid defects that we end up treating with things like Latter-J, and we'll go into that more in a moment. I think when asking this question of open versus arthroscopic approach, the fundamental question is whether one can address the pathology equally as well with an arthroscopic approach as our open surgery. I would submit to you that open surgery is still probably considered the gold standard, and so the question is, can we reproduce the same procedure arthroscopically? There are clearly differences in how the capsule is tensioned and balanced between the two. And to start there, again, with your open bank card repair, you're working like you see here in the pictures, putting a suture anchors in, and then repairing the capsule. Get a pointer. Oops. I'm trying to get a pointer here. We're repairing our capsules, you see down here. That's going to be very different than our arthroscopic approaches, where, of course, we're working inside the joint, typically with capsular plication sutures passed arthroscopically. With an open capsular shift, we have the ability to overlap the capsule. So we can not only tension the capsule appropriately, but we, but we can overlap the tissue. And we'll see that that's harder to do, of course, arthroscopically. There's a different technique of capsular tightening when you're using arthroscopic suturing. This just goes through kind of briefly standard approaches arthroscopically using standard suture passing instruments to um, placate the capsule, take bites of the capsule, pass sutures through. Often I will, or more commonly, I will put a suture anchor in to the glenoid, even with an intact labrum, and use those sutures to placate the capsule. This here shows passing our sutures through. Really the standard suture passing techniques. And the challenge here is how many bites of tissue to take, how big a bite of tissue do we take. Of course, um, as we take bigger bites of tissue, we shorten the capsule more. Average is 20 degrees loss of rotation for each centimeter of plication. So this just shows what these sutures can look like here. Looking from the front here, looking down at it, so our sutures pass, and as you tension the sutures, it tightens the capsule down there. I'll move on from there. With open shoulder stabilization, I think this may be considered the gold standard. Still has the lowest failure rate. We can go back to the classic paper of Carter Rowe from 1978, a large series of open bank card procedures with a relatively low recurrence rate of 3.5% with open surgery. I think open shoulder stabilization allows the ability to address all of these things here. We can certainly address label pathology. We can address the capsule. Bony lesions, of course. We can easily address humeral side of the evulsion of the glenohumeral ligaments and rotator interval lesions as well can all be addressed via open surgery. Some specific advantages of open shoulder stabilization. Again, we have direct access to the labral lesion for repair. Importantly, the open approach allows the ability to precisely set capsular tension 
and allows a balancing of the capsule. So the arm can be placed in the position of function. So we can put the arm in varying positions of abduction and external rotation and repair the capsule there and kind of set the capsule tension, which is different arthroscopically. So I think an advantage here is the ability to, as you see on the lower right, set the capsule tension and then repair the capsule in that position. We can overlap the capsule and thus strengthen the tissue. The open approach also allows direct evaluation and repair of a rotator interval capsular defect. The open approach also certainly allows access to repair of a humeral side of the avulsion, which can be hard to recognize or fix arthroscopically. So all these are advantages of the open approach. What are some disadvantages? Well, certainly it requires an incision. There's pain. There's blood loss. There's certainly more surgical time. Often we use a subscapularis tenotomy, and there is some risk of failure of the subscapularis repair. We should recognize that that does happen. It's uncommon, but it can happen. Now, an alternative approach is to use a subscapularis muscle splitting incision. However, this does not allow clear access to close a rotator interval defect. If you're working just through a split, like you see lower right here, it's harder to appreciate your rotator interval capsular defect. The open approach certainly allows us to just address one side of the joint. We cannot repair a concomitant superior labral lesion, as you see being fixed here arthroscopically. So about the arthroscopic approach, when might we favor that? Certainly there's smaller incisions, cosmesis may be an issue. The arthroscopic approach allows us to address other intraarticular pathology, such as rotator cuff or superior labral lesions. It does not require a subscapularis tenotomy, so you avoid all the issues that go with that. The arthroscopic approach allows us to work on both sides of the joint. And it's important to recognize that there is often injury to both sides, both sides of the joint, the so-called circle concept. You may have injury and an anterior instability pattern unidirectional, but there often is some injury to the posterior capsule. Now, it's uncommon you need to address that, frankly, surgically, but the arthroscopic approach allows you the ability to do so if you need it. So you can work on both sides of the joint, which is harder, of course, to do via your open approach. One a disadvantage of the arthroscopic approach is that we don't have the ability to set the capsular tension with the arm in the position of function. Again, the arm in varying degrees of abduction and external rotation, hard to do that arthroscopically. And generally, the arm is kind of more in the neutral position, internal rotation for arthroscopic visualization. Hard to place the arm up here, it closes it down the front, and it's hard to work and hard to see. Similarly, it's hard to overlap our capsular flaps with arthroscopic approach. Again, this is the pictures from the open approach, which allows you to do this harder to do this overlapping arthroscopically. Other things to consider concerns regarding the arthroscopic approach is difficult, of course, to repair your humeral sided avulsion of the glenohumeral ligaments. It can be difficult to recognize a rotator interval defect and difficult, certainly, to perform glenoid bone grafting for bone deficiency, although some are carrying out arthroscopic ladder jets. Recurrence rate is something that's critical when talking about shoulder instability. And if you look at the literature, in general, the recurrence rates with arthroscopic repairs have been higher. Those rates are getting better. As we get better at the technique and as we frankly choose our patients more appropriately, these, these numbers are lower. But this is just one example. Our early um, experience at special surgery, high recurrence rate, 18% recurrence. And some of these were patients that you wouldn't do today. Um, lax individuals, contact athletes, things like that. But if you look at the literature, you see these recurrence rates over 10 or 15 percent with arthroscopic approaches. So again, it's, it's something to consider. Bone loss is certainly an issue, and you sort of um, the world's leader a moment ago and talk about this, so not much more I can say, but I think just to recognize the issue of bone loss and how that figures in your algorithm for treatment, whether it's glenoid side, as you see on the left, or hill sacs lesions, and certainly um, your glenoid surgery, your bone grafting are often going to be done via an open approach. As you've heard, most recommend glenoid bone graft for glenoid defects over 20, or as you heard in the last talk, 25% of the glenoid. Whether that's a ladder J or iliac crest or other bone graft, um, they can all be used effectively. Your ladder J, as you are familiar with, and it, you've gone through this already, so pretty standard techniques for bone grafting the glenoid. You've seen all this. Iliac crest, some have used as well, similar fashion, similar principles. I think go back to your basic principles, and so here's just taking a, a bone block, your open approach here, fixing the bone block to the glenoid rim, same principles as with the ladder J as far as positioning the graft appropriately relative to the glenoid, secure fixation, repair of the capsule, same basic principles to augment glenoid bony deficiency. 
I think there's probably still no consensus on when to address the Hill Sachs lesion. I very much agree with Dr. Etoy. I think it's uncommon that we need to address the Hill Sachs. Um, the concept of a glenoid tract makes very good sense. I've always thought that um, the engaging lesion concept doesn't make sense either. If you have a tight enough shoulder, it won't engage. And frankly, they're all engaging. For you to get the lesion in the first place, they had to engage at one time when you dislocated. But as Dr. Etoy showed, if your capsule is repaired, it's unusual that your, uh, your hill sacs will engage, unless, of course, it's very large or there's associated glenoid bone loss. So again, I think after appropriate capsule repair, the lesion will rarely engage. The options, though, for treatment, if you need to, are, as discussed earlier, either bone grafting or the remplissage procedure. Just picture showing your remplissage, the repair of the infraspinatus tendon into the hill sacs defect, essentially rendering the hill sacs lesion extra articular. But as Dr. Etoy showed, that will change your kinematics. It changes your glenoid tract, and motion loss is always a concern when doing this. So lastly, my current algorithm for the first time dislocator, I will consider surgery for the young athlete in a contact or collision sport, you know, American football, things like that. Lacrosse is very popular in New York where I am, because in this age group, recurrence rates are so high. I think in our older or recreational athlete, I will try a trial of rehabilitation with physical therapy. Important factors that can predict an increased risk of recurrence include young age, contact sports, Patients with generalized ligamentous laxity may have um, loose joints in a general sense. They may have had prior contralateral instability on the other shoulder. Those are all negative prognostic factors. Certainly, if there is significant bone loss, that's another factor that can lead you toward early surgery due to the risk of recurrence. I think it is okay to try and rehabilitate the athlete and return them to play in the same season if they're injured early in the season. It usually takes at least one month, though, for the athlete to return to play. And there is a risk of recurrence. You need to carefully counsel your athlete. It depends a lot on this particular pathology, and it depends on the athlete's sport. Again, young athlete, contact sport, your risk of recurrence is very high. Um, if the patient has an early recurrence with sport, then certainly they go on to surgery. I think, although we don't know this for sure, but I believe that one single recurrence is unlikely to change the surgical procedure or the expected outcome. Certainly, numerous recurrences can lead to Degenerative joint changes in the joint, no different than the chronically ACL insufficient knee with recurrent giving way. I think we need to avoid that. But a single recurrence, I don't think has made a big difference, but you need to carefully counsel your patients. I think the otoscopic approach can generally be used for first time dislocator if there is good tissue quality and there's no excessive capsular laxity. Now, I do find that I'm doing more procedures uh, for uh, open procedures now via an open approach for contact or collision athletes due to the substantial recurrence rates in these athletes using the arthroscopic approach. So that 17-year-old high school athlete, football player, there's a high risk of recurrence with arthroscopic approaches. Wrestlers, we're tending to go back to our standard open surgery in that setting. Other factors that I think lead to early surgery would again be a large glenoid bone lesion. Really, this would be a fracture because most glenoid bone loss occurs gradually over time. If there's a true acute fracture, then that's a reason to do surgery early, or certainly an associated subscapularis tendon tear that uncommonly occurs. I'll stop there. Thank you.